And we've got a few more people shuffling in. All right, okay, take two. I've done this so many times and yet I always still manage to uh, mess up. So welcome everybody. Um, thank you so much for being here for this artist talk for the exhibition Endings and Beginnings. My name is Amber Phelps Fondra. I'm the Programming Director at Neutral Ground Artist Run Center. Um, and I'm very pleased to be uh, welcoming you all for this artist talk, which is um, in conjunction with this exhibition that we have up in our main gallery right now from April 10th until the 24th, which showcases the work of um, a group of artists who are currently MFA candidates at the University of Virginia. Um, they include Shamim Agaminiha, Shima Agaminiha, Larissa Kichimonia, Reagan Moynes, Alyssa Scott, Amy Snyder, and Brando Pott. So um, all of our seven exhibiting artists will be speaking for about seven to eight minutes, each about their work in the exhibition and perhaps a little bit more broadly about their work. Uh, we will save about 15 minutes at the end for some questions and conversation about the um, entirety of the exhibition. So if you could save your questions and thoughts till the end, we'll probably run just over one hour. So hour 15 and hour 20 about there. We've got a lot of work to look at and to discuss. Um, before we begin, I do want to um, take a moment to express gratitude for the land that Neutral Ground is on. We are located on Treaty 4 territory, which is the traditional territory of the Mahiawak, Anishinaabe, Dakota, Dakota, Lakota, and homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, neutral ground is currently not open to the public, but we're existing here in virtual digital space, and we're very um, grateful to be on these lands. Uh, we are also very grateful to our key funders, who include the Canada Council for the Arts, Sask Arts, the City of Regina, and Sask Lotteries. Um, and we also would like to thank our numerous community members, volunteers, board members, and members of the general public who make Neutral Ground um, who it is, and for us to be able to be here. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our um, exhibiting artists. We have, um, we're going to start sort of in order of how the exhibition is laid out, and I'll keep gallery cam on here and do a bit of a, a virtual tour. Um, our first artist up is Alyssa Scott. Thank you so much, Amber. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Alyssa, and I'll start by sharing my screen here. So in my talk today, I'll be sharing with you my process from the previous semester all the way up to this semester and how that's informed my, my work that's currently up in the show. So last semester, I worked on a print installation project and this is kind of still a work in progress. And the way that this started um, was I was imagining the feeling of uh, walking through the trails at my home and sort of like that late uh, golden hour glow around all the trees. So on some of the banners, I printed my poem over and over. And then on the other banners, I printed with the uh, leaves and grass that I gathered from around the university. And then it was just their silhouette that was left on the papers. So the lighting also made it that the paper became more see-through and then you can kind of read the words from, from behind the paper from the surface uh, in the back. And uh, as you would walk through this space, like more surfaces would be revealed that weren't there before as well. So here's some detail. And so the way that that informed my work this semester was the first thing I did was I made these maquettes as sort of smaller versions of that installation. And the first one, I just kind of eyeballed it. Then the next one, I took the real measurements and proportioned that so that it was uh, more accurate. 
I also made these like little tiny versions of myself and they kind of make me giggle, but they're uh, so that I can place them on the maquettes and imagine them at different sizes. So whether it be like 10 times smaller than reality, all the way to uh, 60 times. Then I placed them on there and sort of imagined it like what if this space was uh, 20 feet tall or 100 feet tall. I also photographed it with different lighting. Then I also started working more on my creative writing. And the way that this poem from, uh, from this semester started was I was thinking about a stream at my home and I was imagining like, what if, what if would it be like to be underneath the stream? And really the stream is only like five centimeters deep, but I imagined it to be like 20 feet. Um, and another part of the stream is that, so it goes from one end of the property and then it goes through the horse's field. Then there's like a hole in the ground and all the water goes down through the hole. You can really hear it go down as well. So I imagined what would this space be like where the water goes down into? It's like this imaginary space. And then that started to inform my maquettes. And so as I was working on my maquettes, I would imagine the space where the water goes down into. Then I started covering it with tissue paper. And I also started to notice how it sort of reminds me of body forms, like uh, ribs, like the wire like ribs and the chest form with the a cavity and also like the paper being like skin too but at the same time I still imagine these spaces as a maquette for a space that uh, could be large as well and this one here kind of reminded me of like a seashell or like maybe like a blanket you can crawl into um, and then I also started working on the form of my poem and I, I uh, placed it in the form of flowing water. And so the poem was also a part of a print. And so that print that is part of the show. And uh, here's just some pictures of the process from carving the lino cut, all the layers. And finally, here it is uh, in detail with the stream in image and then the poem in the form of flowing water beneath. I also um, used one of the layers of the lino cut prints to print uh, in blue abstractedly onto the tissue paper. And then I used that to cover the sculpture. And here's some detail of that as well. And finally, here they are together, both of them. And also um, the, the way that the sculpture uh, is formed, it sort of follows a similar shape as the print and the, uh, the poem. And so uh, with this, the print in, uh, with the stream in the print, the image of the stream, and then my, my poem, and then finally the uh, sculpture on the outside of that. Um, so that's it. Thank you, everybody, for uh, listening to my talk, and I'll pass it on to the next person. Hi, everyone. Hey. Uh, um, uh, hi, everyone. My name is Shima. And I start with my sharing the screen. Mm. Uh, uh, my name is Shima Aramiha, and uh, I am a feminist. And uh, I define uh, this is how I define my art because I, I feel a sense of responsibility and I want to be a voice for women to represent mine and another one pain in a deeper medium in art. And uh, in this semester, I work uh, on an installation uh, that, that is name is Volumes of Words. And uh, in this piece, I want to show the barriers women all around the world face during their lifetime. 
And this um, hardness in the difference of the material is a metaphor uh, to, um, rep to represent the difficulties that um, problems that women uh, face in distinct social context. For example, in Islamic um, countries, uh, Islamic rules affect the society and um, support the patriarchal system. Uh, because of this, we observe the egregious forms of abuse of women's rights uh, in, their, in their territories, such as my country, uh, that women cannot, uh, uh, women have no rights for uh, many things. For example, uh, writing uh, even small things and larger things, such as uh, divorce and um, escape a poisonous relationship, or then right to sing, right to dance, or uh, bigger things that um, they cannot control their bodies, and uh, many problems that are um, sometimes bigger than. Uh, um, they, they, and they cannot carry this pressure uh, in their lifetime. And um, this, their voice became uh, silent uh, in their truth. And they cannot uh, speak they prob about their problems. And uh, this is like a bite that uh, is stuck in, the, in their truth and, can, and don't let them to breathe. Like this. And... Sometimes this patriarchal pressure uh, results that um, sorry, I, I have to say sometimes these words, those oppressed women and their stories bury forever uh, in the graves, and they cannot um, bury forever with themselves in their graves. Sometimes they face the harshest penalties if they disobey the patriarchal rules. This, or sometimes women themselves prefer to be silent forever and take their valuable lives with uh, the, more, the most uh, painful way, setting on fire. But, uh, and some places are bigger than another one. Uh, by making this difference, uh, I want to um, say that Uh, and, and the bigger ones in the first level and the um, medium size in the medium level and the little one on the, uh, on the third level. I, I don't want to underestimate the women in the um, developed countries and uh, issues um, that women um, engage in their lifetime in developed countries uh, because uh, although the, the <clears throat> Western countries having a very better situation, at least in terms of civil laws. But uh, we all, there is also a there is a still other thing that threatens women's lives, such as sexual harassment in the workplaces and, um, and domestic violence. That um, that all of us know this um, problem at the glass ceiling that. Um, inhibit women to grow and there is a there is a real barrier uh, for women to to enjoy their lives to shine to grow and coming to canada was uh, an end for me uh, to break my silence and uh, begin uh, talk about this problem and uh, this is how it uh, how mm, my artwork fit in the in the this exhibition and this is the end of my talk and i will pass it to my sister Hello everyone, I'm Shamin and uh, we share many uh, concerns together, but a little more different. Um, I started sharing my screen as well. Um, um, I, I prefer to... <laughs> the story of my journey begins on 21st of January when I landed in Canada and breathed in a free land. 
The concept of my artwork and the main theme of my practice is to criticize the dictatorship regime currently ruling my land. The feel of sympathy for my compatriots um, reinforce uh, me to picture the tyrannical incidents to conceptual forms and shapes. The office of uh, the Ayatollah office is an installation with three components. The news is uh, the turban snake sculpture, the blood cup, a combined, uh, I'm, okay. Uh, I combined the black turban, uh, mullahs uh, were, and uh, the black snake figure as a metonym for the devilish character of Khamenei, Iran's current dictator, and as a sign to refer the ancient Iranian mythology. Snake Shoulder King is a part of Iranian folklore, uh, Perdusi written in Shahnameh. The legend is retold with the main character given the name of Zahak and changed from a supernatural monster into an evil human being. Two black snakes are on Zahak's shoulders. Evil appears to Zahak in the form of a skilled physician. He conceals Zahak that the only mean of soothing the snakes and preventing them from killing him is to set, uh, satiate their hunger by supplying them with a stew made from two human brains every day. I see Khamenei and Zahak as similar characters. He has been murdered Iranian young people during his tyrannical dictatorship in diverse ways, such as uh, killing them and shooting them in protest uh, under torch in prison. But his favorite way is hanging, uh, because I think it is the most brutal way to kill someone who is captive cannot escape and his family thinks he's going to be free, but rather they will be informed he's executed. And it's, it's repetitive uh, for many people in Iran. So I made uh, some uh, uh, the nooses. I thought about using ready-made actual rope to make a, a news, but after seeing the picture, mm. Oh, no. sorry, I just, um, just let me find uh, the right. Um, sorry, just go and read that because I couldn't find the picture. I'm sorry. Um, but after seeing the picture of the mothers who lost their sons, this idea crossed my mind if I just hang simple one while I can add more details into it. In each news, there is a pair of pale, unhappy lips that grief has left a print, uh, permanent mark around known, around, known as the grief line. There are smiles, the, the, the smiles that they had because they, they thought that their son will be freed in a few weeks. But instead, they uh, found him dead. Their smile has been destroyed forever and turned into grief lines. This line will never disappear and turn, turns their natural faces into faces like mourners. Even if they smile, it shows they can never smile again after what happened to their beloved ones. The nooses do not, uh, don't only mm, take lives, but also ruin families and happiness and smiles forever. In the meantime, while working on the pieces and making nooses, their faces, their voices uh, that ask people for help to be their voice played in my mind. Sometimes I cried, but sometimes I felt strong and inspired by their bravery and courage. And uh, I plan to continue with the theme of Iran's uh, issue through ceramic sculpture. There was a leaked tape of uh, one of the victims, uh, Navid Afkari, that asked all the free and honorable people in the world to be his voice and his family voice. I'm trying to be their voice and to raise awareness regarding human rights abuse in Iran. Um, I... These are the more details of my work. And the news.
experiences. If you if you go in person, uh, it will be more uh, obvious, uh, and uh, nothing can uh, no, no picture can show the exactly uh, being in the atmosphere and around the objects. And um, I'm done. I will pass it to the next person. Hi, everyone. Um, just give me a second now. Okay. Settings. And, uh, can you tell me if you can see it full screen? Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, I'm going to admit that I'm about to read out to you a statement that I've had to write for my, my supervisor and other faculty. Uh, I'm taking it for a bit of a test drive, I guess. Um, and I'll share images of my work as well, of course. But I also want to first give you a kind of warning that the subject matter of my statement and my work is really very dismal. And I'm so sorry about it, but there's nothing I can do at this moment <laughs> about it. Uh, so, here I'll go. Um, I know, uh, sorry, life as uh, we know it on this planet is dying. And as one of the authors of the article, Biological Annihilation via the Ongoing Sixth Mass Extinction writes, it's entirely our fault. How does one read a statement such as the following and proceed to live their life? Quote, our data indicate that beyond global species extinctions, Earth is experiencing a huge episode of population decline and extirpations, which will have negative cascading consequences on ecosystems functioning and services vital to sustaining civilization, end quote. I don't know what to do with this knowledge. My work stems from this personal dilemma, how to face the fact that we are destroying the planet while continuing to live and create nonetheless. When I began working on Keep It Up, Hold It Together, and Build a Wall this year, they were at first a representation of climate-induced drought. They then became a critique of our reliance on technology to get us out of the mess we've created. At this stage, they came from a place of criticism and anger towards my species. My thinking went as follows. While some technology can help us reduce the damage we are causing to the planet, these solutions also require us to change how we lead our lives, and we are not, as a society, changing quickly enough. Other innovations proposed for getting us out of this crisis are too expensive, too slow, and too dangerous. As Elizabeth Colbert concludes in her book, Under a White Sky, The Future of Nature, enthusiasm for the technological solutions to climate change that the experts she'd interviewed were working on was always quote, tempered by doubt, end quote. She shares how one scientist's, quote, preferred drug analogy for the technology solutions is chemotherapy. No one in his right mind would undergo chemotherapy were better options available. We live in a world, this uh, innovator said, where deliberately dimming the fucking sun might be less risky than not doing it, end quote. We are doomed and we are getting desperate. As a ceramicist, the situation of grappling for solutions to the climate crisis while we continue to cause it via our ever increasing rates of emissions had me imagining a potter not learning how to make a pot properly, cracks are a potter's bane, yet hoping to fix the problem after the fact. I set out to convey the situation via the plates in this set expecting that their ridiculous repairs would work as a metaphor of our predicament. I wanted these pieces I was making to point blame at all of us for collectively getting us here, and if lucky, spur a few on to do something about it. At the same time, I couldn't answer a key question. If we're doomed, then why even make such pieces? What I realized while preparing to install these pieces in this show at Neutral Ground just last week was that what they actually represent is the fact that I myself am cracking under the anxiety of this impending doom. Looking at the pieces at, that at the time were titled A Pound of Cure, 
I realize that I'm the one who is trying to hold it together. After a few years of climate change education and activism, I'm worn down. What do I do to keep going, to keep it up? I build a wall to keep myself from fully confronting what the science is saying. Countless species, including our own, are or will soon be experiencing extinction. I know I won't see the end of humankind in my lifetime, but I still feel as though I'm living on a precipice, hovering, watching others go down, smashing. These pieces are a self-portrait. I'll now talk about my second set of pieces in the show, Dust. Dust is a project that, like my previous conceptual ceramic work on climate change, Saskatchewan Glacier, um, consists of entirely ephemeral works that I must continually create as they are continually destroyed. Even more fragile this time, the entire point of the plates and bowls in dust is that they will not survive. In this way, these are the final pieces of ceramics made entirely of dust that returns to being dust. To create this dust, I grind clay found on very local land. Clay creates a fine dust that is dangerous to breathe. Hence, ceramicists do everything they can to avoid it. The plates and bowls uh, I make with this material symbolize the drought we'll be facing in this part of Canada as a result of climate change. This drought will both interfere with our ability to grow the food we put on our table and, to create, and it will create other dangers to our health and survival. I choose not to fire these pieces so that they remain entirely temporary and leave just about as close to a zero footprint on the planet as any material-based work can. This semester, I've made progress in understanding what my current work means to me. I still have a ways to go though. I still don't have a good answer for that key question. If we're doomed, why even make such pieces? If the situation we're in is hopeless, why create anything at all? Why even convey my sense of hopelessness? Or is it that something in me refuses to be entirely hopeless? As my supervisor, David Garneau tells me, quote, any gesture of making is always a gesture of hope, end quote. I'm still not sure how to respond to that statement, but I intend to spend more time thinking about it in the months and semesters ahead. That's it. Thanks, Amy. And um, up next, we will move on to Larissa. Hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, good evening, and thank you for being here. Uh, thank you to Nutra Ground for hosting us as well. Um, so fair warning, I have two small children, and they are at that hour of <laughs> losing their minds. So if you hear screaming, <laughs> it's probably them. Um, so, which just is funny because my artwork has to do with that. Um, so I will share my screen. This is this one I'll share. And I am going to play from the beginning. So, um, like I said, my name is Larissa Kitchimonia. For those of you that don't know me, I am a mother, a student, and an artist. Um, I am from the Key First Nation, which is a Soto community in southeastern Saskatchewan. Um, I just recently realized, or like through research, realized that I'm actually from, I'm, an, I'm a Manitobian. <laughs> um, my people originally lived by uh, Shoal River and that's something I'm, I'm realizing and trying to wrap my mind around. Um, so the painting I'm going to be talking about tonight is called Pregnancy Brain. Um, the story behind it and just to give you some context is um, when I was doing my education degree before I started my master's. I've since put it on hold. Um, I was nine months pregnant at the time and I was going to school and I was 
struggling my way through trying to do six classes a semester and to keep learning and to keep moving towards my goals while being pregnant with my youngest son. Um, this painting was really just about, um, I think wanting to express that, that raw feeling and this like really bad brain fog that I had while I was pregnant with him. And it, <laughs> it was, it was like this really weird moment where I thought like, I'm so, I'm in this really cool place of creation, but at the same time, it's like, I can't keep my sentences or my thoughts in order. And I was really struggling with trying to uh, keep that momentum in my classes. And this was the result of it. Um, so what else did I want? want to say oh um so just to explain some of the the details in it um the floral patterns in the background i always kind of associate those with my grandmother um we have a cradle board in my family that all of us have been put in at one point or another and i always kind of do these florals as a, kind of like a nod to her and and i guess my lineage uh the the red marks down the center of the body are a representation of me creating my roots but also I'm creating like this family tree so it's supposed to mimic that kind of imagery um oh and then also it's just like this sweet sweet beautiful little baby that is now a year old was just like robbing my brain of all nutrients <laughs> and like all blood flow and he was stealing it all and I could barely even make sense of a lot of things. So um, the materials used are an acrylic wash kind of deal on rice paper and I really wanted it to have this texture. I'm still going through this texture phase. I really want my work to have this very like grainy almost like um, I want I want to be able to like feel it as much as I can see it. Um, so yeah, this was just a reflection of of my my pregnancy brain and my my experience as trying to struggle my way through being pregnant. Um, so another piece that isn't in the exhibition, but I was going to speak about briefly, is. Um, a piece titled All My Relations. And this is also um, some very current work. I did this last semester and this is just dealing with um, intergenerational matrilineal knowledge. So again, like I'm really interested in working with um, my lineage, my heritage, my my um, my ancestors kind of like connecting with this, this kind of um, these kinds of ideas. Um, so this one is about the interconnectedness and also the lost narratives. Um, so the figures on the floor are my representation of these stories of these ancestors that I have, but I don't necessarily, that are connected to me through just like my lineage and my, my family, but I, I don't necessarily have any attachment to them. So they're somehow like removed from this like, jumble of these women that circle me throughout my life and that nurture me and support me and they're just removed but still somehow connected um yeah and that's all i have thank you for listening to me ramble on and i will pass it on to whoever is next thank you so much larissa uh next up we have brenda Hi, I'm just going to take a moment and share my screen. Okay. Um, I selected three works from this year to uh, put in the show, be and I selected them based on the pieces that I thought spoke to the theme endings and beginnings the best. And so I will start with uh, this one here. Um, at the beginning of the year, I think for everybody, um, our, our normal patterns of life, our normal activities all changed very suddenly. And um, so in this illustration, I was responding to COVID and the changes that we all had to undergo, whether it was 
events being canceled or uh, working from home, working on Zoom, that sort of thing. Uh, one of the things that was happening at the time was that there were shortages. Um, and one of the things we were short of was masks. And of course, at that point, um, craft sales and activities that some of the, the seniors that normally depended on them for, for activity and for social connections were being canceled as well. And people were beginning to find new ways to cope and deal with these things. So I was thinking of two things when I was doing this. One was the changes in our patterns of, of life and activity. And the other thing I was thinking of at the same time is I love old things for some reason. Um, when I started to do this, I thought of the old Singer sewing machine that my mother had and old China. And when objects become old um, vintage uh, objects, there's a certain beauty in them, uh, the wear in them and, and the fact that I guess maybe they're rare. And yet I'm always surprised that when I look around my house, I look at the objects in my home and I think of them as clutter or objects of no consequence. And yet I'm old enough to know that 10 years later or 15 years later, I look at them with a, from a, a totally different view and they become precious and beautiful. And so when I was doing this, I was documenting an activity that occurred due to COVID um, and our changes in our patterns, but I was also documenting objects that might be recognized in 15, 20 years um, as vintage objects with some value. So all the masks in the bottom that this lady has, has sewn um, are actual patterns that were, um, the ladies were buying them from Walmart as crafts, crafts wares. Um, and those actually sold out and became hard to get as well. But they're all actual patterns that, that were there. Um, I included things like the measuring tape the yellow measuring tape, which my mother had, and I have one, and I think you can still buy yellow ones, um, but this one doesn't have metric on it. It's just inches, um, and the old wooden chair, and the pattern on the lady's uh, shirt is a, a pattern from a store that just recently went out of business, and it was very common with people, um, women who, who, a lot of women shopped at that store, um, and, and you'd see those, those fabrics quite frequently. So um, in a sense, I think of this as it's a document that documents um, COVID and, and our activities, and it also documents a period of history. And it'll be interesting to look back at it in a number of years and, and look at some of the objects. Uh, the second one also was, is an ending um, that occurred as a result of COVID. Um, it's my, my mother and my brother, and they were trying to get out um, and because you couldn't, we couldn't socialize or meet in areas like coffee shops and things like that. And so you had to find other ways to get together. And of course, while the weather was nice, um, one of the places that we would go was to Innovation Place by the university because there weren't usually a lot of people there. And I'm a firm believer that getting outside in nature has huge health benefits for all of us, but particularly for seniors. Um, and so both of these plates that I have here, I did last semester, and they are painted with China paint on porcelain. And I'm also, when I was working on this one, I was also thinking about, you know, the fact that at that point we were, even when we were outside, we were being asked to, to maintain that six foot distance. And that was sort of the beginning of that, that time. And now a year later, here we are. Um, then I've included one that I worked on this semester as well. And I hope you guys don't mind my picture of, of bugs. Um, but again, I think two things are happening right now. One is we have for a few years been experiencing climate change. And so we're starting to see species and plants appear here that we haven't had before. Um, and of course, the other thing that's happening is because we, because of COVID, we're home more, we're in our, our backyards and whatnot a lot more. And I think we're, we're more aware of the creatures in our backyard. And in some cases, these creatures are substituting in or standing in for some of the lack of human contact. We're watching birds and, and other things. I have in the past done a lot of jars and I put stories on the jars so that you can look at the story and sort of follow the story around the, the circumference of the jar. And in the past, I've always shown 
larger species, you know, like the snowy owl that lands in my backyard or um, the um, gray partridge that, uh, that spend the winter in our backyard. But in the fall last year, um, I was cleaning up and I noticed in the bottom lower corner here, this caterpillar. It's actually four inches long and about three quarters of an inch in diameter. And I was fascinated with this guy. I've never seen anything like it before. And so I wanted to know what it was. I didn't, uh, I just left it alone. I didn't want to harm it um, because I didn't know what it was. And so I did some research and what I discovered was it is new to this area. I think um, I noticed in Facebook, a couple of people reported seeing it just within the last year or so. Um, it was native, uh, more commonly found in North Dakota. So it's fairly new here but it is an Ackerman Sphinx and it becomes a moth that is about three inches large. Um, and I became fascinated with this um, caterpillar's life cycle. At first, of course, I was concerned a caterpillar would eat your plants um, and I was a little bit worried about that. But what I discovered was he's actually quite harmless. There's only ever one caterpillar. I have grapevines in my backyard and uh, that's what they eat and so, um, he, he will pollinate, he'll only, um, there'll only be one moth from him and, and the moth will be uh, an important pollinator. So this jar is when it was just made and it's still wet. Um, and of course this yellow paper here or this pink paper is so that I can lift the lid off while it's still wet. Um, so I made a jar about the moth. Um, the moth comes out at night and if you were to go around the jar, I only just have one picture. If you were to turn the jar and go around, you would see the life cycle of this caterpillar as it turns into a moth. And of course, I selected this one because I think um, uh, the life cycle of a caterpillar and a moth or a butterfly chrysalid um, actually really represents beginnings and endings quite well because they actually have it's one, one species, but it lives as though it has two completely different lives. And so I think my time is up and I will pass, I'll end my share here and pass this on to Reagan. I'll share. Sorry, I'm just sharing my screen here. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Reagan Moynes. And um, the work that I have in the gallery at Neutral Ground is entitled Worm. And it is um, an ongoing um, meditation on as I sort of negotiate my way through um, traumatic memory and identity and um, sort of how those two things kind of interrelate. So a lot of the work that I do, which I don't have any of my old work that I'm going to show or anything, but a lot of the work that I do is in some way this idea of trying to um, navigate trauma, but also um, like represented in a way that's beyond language. Um, and so what I've been really thinking about lately is sort of the impossibility of that and the, lim the limitations of representation when it comes to identity and, um, and trauma. So this work is sort of a reflection on that. And it was really... It, it came about um, during COVID at the beginning when we were spending a lot of time alone um, in our homes. And it, um, it was a very like introspective time for me. And I was having a tough time kind of um, with uh, unprocessed like memories coming up. And I had this impulse to purge my closet. Um, and I saw this sort of in two ways. Um, I saw it sort of as this destructive um, impulse to sort of rid myself of the past and those identities and those memories, but also um, as a way to kind of make space for something new. 
so I, um, I began to deconstruct the clothing in my closet and um, I'm sort of using the contents of my closet um, as a way to speak about this kind of this very complex intersection between memory and identity and trauma. And I see these garments as um, an emotional and material and tactile um, record of these memories. And so, um, yeah, I was utilizing these garments um, in the work and I began to create this tubular form. And I think the most important thing about this work um, that I need to tell you is that it's, I see it as being perpetually in the process of, um, of becoming. It's never finished. It's this kind of ongoing exploration. Um, and I think that that speaks to my experience with um, trying to negotiate my way through what I might call an identity crisis. Um, and yeah, so this is a reflection of that. So this, the way that the work is configured in the space in neutral ground is it's interacting with a plinth. It's in conversation with the, the photo of my, of my work. Um, and I use soft sculpture as a way to kind of further my um, further question the idea of representation and this idea of memorializing something. So um, the way that the way that I kind of see that is sculpture is traditionally or historically um, connected to you know the idea of memorializing uh, the the lives of public people like through monuments and stuff. So soft sculpture for me is a way to kind of work with that and subvert those ideas. And so the material that I use is really important because it's always amenable. It can be deconstructed again, it can be reconstructed into something else, it can be reconfigured. And this is all sort of, um, yeah, a reflection of uh, what I'm, thinking about these days in terms of identity. So I, I, I see this work as kind of, um, it's autobiographical um, and it, but it kind of fails to provide the viewer with a narrative and, um, but it can't really be read outside of a narrative or outside of like the context of me. So I'm kind of, I don't know, I'm really just playing around with sort of different ideas about how, how much can we really know about somebody else's inner world or somebody else's um, identity. And I want to do so in this work. Um, I think that is all I have to say. Um, I guess the other sort of important part of the work is the sewing. I use sewing as a method um, because of its relationship to ideas of repairment and reclamation um, and, it's, and it's labor intensive. So this work for myself on a personal level is really um, about a commitment to kind of this this restoration process of these difficult memories and these th this these embodied experiences as a result of tra traumatic experiences. So, yeah, um, that's all I'd say. Thank you. Thanks, Reagan, and uh, thank you, everyone who has uh, spoken tonight and shared some insight into your work. I'm just gonna reel the gallery camera over. You were all very timely. I thought we would be running over time, but everybody just like stayed to five minutes right on the nose. So we've got lots of time for questions or comments if anybody, um, has any, and um, we could just go kind of popcorn style. If anyone wants to unmute, you're welcome to raise your hand if that's also 
more your speed and I could um, I mute you also questions in the chat are, are welcome. I know this period of time is always the awkward moment in the zoom call where we ask if you have anything to say. <laughs> and I'm going to just change um, my view over to gallery view I might suggest doing the same if anybody um, in our viewing audience wants to turn on their cameras you're welcome to to say hi I know that um, it's always nice to see some friendly faces. <laughs> yes, I might ask, and maybe um, Amber just can answer this quickly. Did, did how you guys went about installing the show, or like the order of things? I realize you probably weren't all there together, but I'm wondering about just the the collaboration that went on to present this. Right, I could I could probably say a couple things about that. Um, uh, thanks for the question, Larissa. Um, we, yeah, this show, um, unfortunate timing in regards to our current COVID realities in Regina. Um, and because there's sort of a brief window for the exhibition to be up, um, we had to be really limited and safe about our interactions. So I made a schedule um, and the artists came in for windows of time between like three hours and an hour. Some had very quick installations, some had longer installations. So from my end, that's how it looked. But I know there was a lot of behind the scenes work. We had, a, we had various meetings as a group. And I know the, um, the artists had a lot of um, collaborative planning that went on without my involvement. So maybe I'll let someone else speak to that process a little bit. Um, so uh, as a group, we also met on Zoom quite a bit. So we talked about the show and what endings and beginning meant for us. We also had a Google Doc. So that was kind of our way to collaborate as well. Um, and we also looked at the gallery map too. So that's kind of how we decided uh, by looking at pictures of our work and then sort of just placing each other in relation uh, to that as well. Yeah, and I might just follow up that question, maybe asking someone, another another artist from the group um, to speak a little bit more about um, the theme that you settled on. And I know because all of you have pretty diverse practices um, and obviously like working together um, in your MFA program, there's some overlaps and some like, you know, inspiration that ideally might happen in working together, but especially this year, uh, working remotely, um, and then coming to this endings and beginnings, which is a bit of a, you know, um, it's a pretty like broad, I don't know if I want to call it a theme, but the title of the exhibition seems pretty fitting for a lot of your work. Um, so I don't know if anyone had anything else to add about how you settled on that. I can jump in. It was uh, actually just a flash of like inspiration, I don't know, luck. Um, we were talking about whether or not we wanted to have a theme or a title like, uh, that would bring the work together at all. And it, it popped into my head, it just seemed, I don't know where it came from, um, but I immediately thought that it was likely something that is so, as Amber said, broad that you could pretty much try to fit any work on any subject into it. And also with the, uh, the, the changes in our reality. And like I uh, said in the statement for the show mentioned the, the pre-COVID life, the post-COVID, um, these defining moments in our, in our contemporary moment uh, that, that create these beginnings and endings. And um, I think that I also uh, asked if we could put it with the endings first to end on a more positive note, which as you can maybe tell is very unlike me. <laughs> but, yeah, hence endings and then beginnings. Uh, 
I was wondering if I could make a comment here um, to everyone at the show. Um, I just want to say um, the show looks great and it's kind of a bummer. Well, it's a super bummer that the place is shut down. Um, but congratulations to everybody uh, on the show and really nice talks tonight. But um, my main comment is really to Neutral Ground. I just want to say thank you to Neutral Ground. Um, it is important that the, the kind of cultural institutions in a city are interconnected and the MFA program, as we all know, is a vibrant, lovely place, lovely thing, uh, a feather in the cap uh, at, of the U of R and um, the fact that Neutral Ground, um, you know, I don't know how all this kind of worked, but the fact that Neutral Ground kind of uh, stepped up and um, has agreed to put together an exhibition of our MFA students um, is fantastic. So. Uh, congrats to everybody and thank you very, very much to um, Amber uh, PB and her team for making this happen. It's really, really appreciated. I second that. <laughs> thank you, Rob. Um, yeah, I mean, on behalf of Mutual Ground, uh, the, the feeling is mutual. It's really great to um, have some connection with current MFA students. I, I'm a, a graduate of the U of R MFA department myself. Uh, so it's lovely to have some uh, familiar faces here. And um, I, I could just say that when I was a student moving to the city uh, to pursue my MFA, I noticed there was quite a, a divide between the cultural institutions of the city and the university, especially as being somebody who was not from here, but who was from relatively close. So um, yeah, we're doing our best to make those connections and hopefully continue them. This year, it is um, unfortunate timing, but obviously we don't have control over the ways of the global pandemic. Um, but I hope that we can continue to work with the U of R in um, some capacity moving forward. And it's been just really lovely working with all of the artists in the show. Um, I, I didn't know most of you prior to this. Um, and so it's been really great to get to know you and to get to know your work as well. And does anyone else have any comments or questions? I see a question in the chat from Margaret, uh, who is curious what folks are working on next. Anyone want to take that one? She says too soon. <laughs> um, for uh, for myself, I guess what's what's next um, is kind of just getting to the end of the semester. And then after that, I guess um, I'll have to give that some more thought afterwards. But I do plan on working on some larger installations. So I do kind of have that dream down there, down the line. <laughs> um, I, I'll say something just yeah. To fill silence. Um, <laughs> uh, I will probably be continuing my work on the worm and kind of expanding it. That's sort of my um, ideas for the summer and working from there. In in the MFA program, like I think you for it's different for everybody, but um, at a certain point, the work just kind of starts to build on each other and and everything. You know, there isn't this kind of like this separation between projects anymore. Everything kind of evolves out of the last project or, you know, again, everybody's experience is different, but um, yeah, just keep going with, with that. <laughs> well, the um, worm will go outside. The, the worm will not, the worm I don't think will go outside this time. Maybe, we'll see. Also to fill, I guess, some air time. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna be working towards a project with the First Nations University. So they are commissioning some paintings off of me to wrap the poles in the library. So if you ever make it to the campus, come check it out. My artwork will be in there as well. Um, uh, 
Uh, as I uh, said in my uh, talk, that uh, it is an ending for me, the suppression of myself in that uh, uh, dictator society, but uh, it's a beginning for me to speak up for my uh, people. And uh, I'm, I, I try uh, to work on the, um, you know, I'm not sure that if you are following the Iran news about the negotiate with the Western countries about nuclear weapons and it's a real big problem for our people because if the government and the regime access the nuclear weapon it will threaten the people of the world and the most people is Iranian people, Iranian. yes and I'm gonna make something uh, some related work uh, to this issue um, and talk about the Iranians uh, human rights issue that related to this topic. Um, I would like to work on the dust project some more. And originally I had in mind a video of a dust, a plate made out of this dust blowing away. So I don't know how I'll get there. Um, <laughs> it was a challenge just to get it to be a plate. And now I have to find a way to destroy it poetically. Um, and then I, I don't know, but I, I feel like I can't go on con, uh, continuing with this degree of like depressing subject matter for too much longer. And I don't know what I'll do, but I, I, I miss, I'm, I'm actually a very joyful person and I miss, I miss making like more joyful work. So I, I don't know, I'm working that out. I'm looking forward to uh, spending a little bit more time exploring the relationships we have with the creatures that we come in contact with. Um, so I'm playing with new ideas and uh, I guess I'm hopeful that if we get to know the creatures in our backyard um, a little bit better, then maybe that might be a step towards solving some of our environmental problems as well. So I'm coming in super late. Well, not really, but so you're all currently um, MFA students? That's right. That's cool. <laughs> and um, never sure how long of a pause to leave not afraid of silence, but um, I did, this might be a good moment to add, um, just in lieu of having in-person viewing of the gallery, uh, which we, we can't do at the moment, um, we will be showcasing uh, most of the artists um, over Instagram Live in the coming days. So starting tomorrow, um, between noon and one o'clock on Instagram Live, We'll be, I'll be just having uh, brief conversations with each of the artists in the show um, in a casual way, kind of getting to know them and um, their work outside of this show a little bit. So if you are on Instagram, you can look for that. Our handle is neutral ground ARC. Um, and those will also be recorded and we'll share them on our um, YouTube channel, which is Neutral Ground Artist Run Center, and eventually on our website, which is uh, neutralground.sk.ca. Um, we have a new website that we'll be launching near the end of the month. It's very exciting. We'll be able to support things like video. <laughs> the new website, it's Risa. Hi, I Risa. just want to say, Amber, if you ever have another gap in your programming again, please don't hesitate to reach out again because I can always continue to connect you with our students. I'm really glad to have connected you with this MFA group. And I'm very proud of the MFA group for having put up such a good show despite the circumstances. So well done, everyone. Yeah, thank you. And um, I will leave one moment and just to see if there's any final questions or comments, thoughts accolades. 
guess I was wondering if any of the students, it's been a different year, of course, as we've all talked about a lot, but if there's any up, like this opportunity has let you sort of step out of the walls and sort of the womb of school, even though it's not the same structure that, not the same program that it could be outside of COVID, whatnot, but like if being, moving yourselves even just physically to a different space, if you found some connections between your works that, and I know we talked about theme versus title a little bit as far as the group, but if any, if anyone sort of saw some sparks of connected connectivity to your peers as far as same lines of thinking or conceptual considerations or yeah, anything like that that maybe came out of this process. I guess one of the connections that I see in uh, the work is that um, across like all of the, the bodies of work, it's very much uh, sculptural. And if it's not sculptural, there is some texture in there too. Um, and I guess, you know, thinking about the body as well, each of the works relate to that in slightly different ways, but that's still a part of it, I think. But I haven't given that uh, too much thought. So I guess I probably have to think about it some more. <laughs> I don't think that this comes across necessarily to others, but I feel that um, the, the very fact that we're all in our MFAs and we're at, from I think at least most of us, the kind of beginnings in our artistic career, that that connects us. And the it's sort of excitement and nervousness of being in this position. Um, well, I, I would say that I definitely noticed some threads of connectivity just around, um, uh, like, well, the climate and the world around you, the world around and the world within, I suppose. Um, so yeah, despite being really disparate, having really disparate practices in some ways, um, I feel like this show um, really works well together. And I can say that um, having worked with you all um, to facilitate this, there seemed to be a really collaborative spirit with the group um, and just this um, real sense of camaraderie, which is wonderful. Um, hope that you can continue to foster that through uh, the MFA experience, even if you're not sharing physical space. Um, yeah, because that's important, we need it. <laughs> um, and I think, uh, if anyone has any other burning comments, now's your chance. Otherwise, I think this might be a nice time to sign off. Um, so I will just thank um, all of the artists once more. Uh, Shamim Agaminiha, Shima Agaminiha, Larissa Kichimonia, Reagan Moines, Alyssa Scott, Amy Snyder, and Brenda Watt. And, um, yeah, I would usually, at this is the point where I would say, come check out the show. Um, I'm going to be sharing a lot more um, documentation through our social media channels. Um, so you can look for us on Instagram, Neutral Ground ARC, on Facebook, Neutral Ground Gallery, um, and also watch out for those um, live conversations we'll be having over the next uh, couple weeks. So thank you all for being here, and I will say good night. <laughs>